be here. I have appreciated your prayers this week as I have dealt with a, about a sickness, but I am glad that I'm COVID free and flu free and pretty much over whatever plague did get me this week. <clears throat> now, if my get up and go would just get up and come back, I would be very happy. Um, but uh, other than that, I am well and I am glad to, to be here and I have appreciated your well wishes and prayers. I invite you to uh, look at our announcements. It's hard to believe that it is November, but you will find a um, uh, calendar there with the important dates for November uh, there in your uh, bulletin. Uh, also remind you of our midweek gathering on Zoom at 6.30 that assuming I'm not um, attacked by any more illness, uh, we will have this week. Uh, the most important announcement, though, in your bulletin is the um, notice about a motion that will be voted upon at our next church conference, which will be the one in November. Our annual deacon election is usually held during the month of November, and according to our bylaws, four deacons rotate off each year, and we vote for on. And the deacons brought a motion that we suspend those rules for uh, this year and allow those four who would have rotated off to continue to serve another year uh, because of the uh, circumstances surrounding COVID. Uh, those four have agreed to continue to uh, serve if it is the pleasure of the church to uh, approve this motion. Uh, but again, this motion will be uh, voted upon at the next church conference. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, also keep in mind we will be observing the Lord's Supper this morning. You should have found the individual servings of communion supplies in, in the rack there in the pew. If you have um, managed to sit somewhere where there are not any, just look around. I'm sure that there are some uh, available close at hand. But I look forward to uh, celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper with you this morning. Thank you. Please stand for our opening hymn, Lord, You Give the Great Commission.
Good morning. So last week we talked about the fruits of the Spirit and how they are good qualities in our lives that God wants us to live out, didn't we? Well, today we're going to continue talking about that. So when you think of an apple, can you make a real apple? Like you have paper or wood. Can you make a real apple that you can eat? Mm -mm. Can something pretend to be a real apple? Yeah. Like if you had a wooden apple, could you eat it? Mm -mm. So when you get a real apple, you grow it. And it starts as this little seed, and it grows bigger and bigger into a tree. And then eventually the apples grow on that tree, right? Mm -hmm. So the fruits of the Spirit is like that, too. You can't make it, and you can't fake it. And it's something that grows inside of you. And it may start small, and then it gets bigger and bigger. And God is there to help us grow those qualities. So those qualities, again, are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And just as that apple grows small God is, and grows bigger, God is growing those qualities in us. So this week what I want you to do is I want you to focus on those qualities and practice them. Okay? All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this day. Please help us to remember the fruits of the Spirit and help them grow in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand now for our offertory hymn, Because I Have Been Given Much. Let us pray for the Lord's blessing upon our offering this morning. Gracious and almighty God, we are thankful for the many gifts which you give us in our lives. Lord, our time and our talent and our treasure. Lord, as we come to this time of our worship service where we are reminded of that which you have blessed us with materially. Lord, may we give back to you a portion of of that which you have given us as you lead us. And Lord, may you take that portion, may you bless it, multiply it, and use it for the work of your kingdom. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
please stand for the doxology. <laughs> Our scripture reading this morning is, once again, the the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. Love, joy, peace. These were the first three in the spiritual fruit basket. These triplets, this trinity, whatever you would like to call them, were the base, the core of the fruit of the Spirit. Their meaning and purpose is woven into all the fruit of the Spirit. Today, as we wrap up our little mini-series on the fruit of the Spirit, we will look at the other six in this basket. Patience. Kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Each of these, when evident in our lives, is further evidence that we are indeed alive in Christ. More fruit, more life more abundance. So let's look at these six additional qualities a little closer as we seek to see what it means to bear the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And the first one is patience. You know, as I was working on my sermon this week, I really should have worn some steel-toed boots because this one steps all over my toes. I don't have much patience. And it's a tough word because what is considered patience to one person can mean something different to someone else. And so many different people in so many contexts have so many different ideas about what it means to be patient. But as it is used here as fruit of the Spirit, it's this. It's being able to endure for a long time whatever challenges may come our way. And persevering without wanting any kind of retribution. We all know that life isn't easy. We know that along the way it will come with its challenges. That there will be people who wrong us. So patience is important. In contrast, I've often heard it said, don't get mad, get even. But when we think about Christ, Christ shows us patience even when he's in the midst of enduring wrongdoing. Not once does Jesus ever try and bring ill will upon those who have wronged him. Not once, not once does he ever get vindictive. But he remains patient even in suffering. That's heavy. 
That's fruit we certainly cannot bear on our own, for it goes against every natural human instinct. But patience also means being able to put up with the weakness and folly of others without getting angry or annoyed. Anybody else wishing they had some of them steel toe boots for their toes right about now? To exercise patience, we've got to have some serious willpower and stamina and a tough tongue from biting it all the time. It ain't easy, though it does come more natural for some than others. Not natural for me. But that's why we need the Spirit to bear it out in our lives. Jesus had remarkable patience in this way as well. Everyone wanted something from Jesus. And no one, not even his closest friends, the inner circle of the disciples, had any real inkling of what Jesus was doing or what was really at work. And they all the time were asking questions or making comments or getting into arguments. And yet he always remained patient and loving. And on the occasions that he did feel the need to rebuke them, He did it in a way that was restorative, not destructive. Patiently bringing them back. We need that kind of patience in our world. Now more than ever. And we as Christians ought to be the shining example of how to do it and what it looks like. But are we? Most would say no. Probably not. In a world of sound bites and memes and social media posts and God bless them, Lord, the comment sections online, patience seems to be a largely ignored virtue. When I see these things, I see some people that simply cannot wait to get their hateful, hurtful words in. And make their point. And the thing that really... uh, See, I need patience with them right now, Lord. But nine times out of ten, there's so much of this hatred that is veiled in Christian language. That is a harmful and hurtful witness. And it's sure not bearing the fruit of the Spirit. The temptation is strong to become impatient in attitude, in communication, in expectations. But when we give in to that, it's detrimental not only to our own relationships, but to our witness. A while back, Nat Geo did this special called Expedition Everest. And on this uh, documentary, movie show, whatever you want to call it. It followed a group of climbers who set out on this mission to install weather stations on the summit of Mount Everest. Because apparently enough people climb Mount Everest now that there's a need for accurate weather forecasting for the top of a 26,000 feet tall, foot tall mountain. Crazy. But as the team climbed, I, I made an observation I'd never really thought about. They were climbing as a team which means they were all tied together, which means they could only move as fast as the slowest among them. And when you climb as a team like that, if someone gets hurt, it slows you down. If they decide they don't want to keep going, you're stuck unless you leave them behind. And I thought back to that documentary as I was thinking about patience and realized patience is a lot like that. In life, one way or another, we're all tied together in this thing we call life. And we need to be more willing to move together rather than just cutting loose those we feel like we need to leave behind. While likewise, we don't need to be the people who tie ourselves to the rock and say, Nope, going as far as I'm going. I shall not be moved. Like the triplets we looked at last week, the sextuplet of qualities we're looking at this week feed into each other. 
And what comes as a natural extension of patience is kindness. If you are a patient, then it's highly unlikely that you're going to find yourself being kind. But when we say kindness, what is it that we, that we mean? When we say that was a kind action or that he, she, they are kind, what do we mean? I think in a nutshell, I think of kindness as being thoughtful of others. To do something that thinks of someone else. When Jesus said, do to others as you would have them do into you, I think that's a pretty good definition of kindness. It can be as simple as a smile or some nice words or a compliment. But it can also be so much more than that and should be so much more than that. Kindness is taking action. It's doing something that you don't have to do because you want to do it. Even with no reward in sight. In in fact, kindness doesn't come with a reward very often. But rather it costs us something to be kind. Whether it be our time, our energy, or our resources. But in action, kindness makes a difference in lives. It changes things. And I guess that's where that phrase, kindness is its own reward, comes into play. But again, that ain't always so easy to believe because it goes against that human instinct that tells us to look after me, myself, and I first. Doesn't always come easily. And it's for that very reason that it's a fruit of the Spirit. And yes, like patience, some people are more naturally kind than others. I'm married to the kindest person I know. And she's probably married to the least patient person she knows. The fruit of the Spirit enables each and every one of us to be filled with God's Spirit and to bear that fruit out in our lives. So as we go about our lives with its family and work responsibilities, we need to trust God to show us how to be kind, to show us the opportunities to do so. They're all around us. The fruit of the Spirit bearing in our life means asking, who can we give an encouraging word today? Who can we help? Am I prepared to show kindness in unexpected situations when it comes up? You can break it down like this. And I can't remember where I read this, but I can't take credit of it as an original thought. But kindness looks like this. What would I do for others If I was Jesus. And what would I do for others if they were Jesus? If we view the world through that lens, I think it changes our definition of kindness a great deal. And with kindness comes generosity. When we say something or someone is generous we generally mean that they do good things they are filled with goodness they give of themselves to do good in the world depending on which translation you read uh, of these verses some say generosity here some say goodness so i'll use them interchangeably But James Brown Smith in The Magnificent Story, the book that we've been doing together on our Wednesday night Zoom, poses this question. What is goodness? Goodness is that which works for the benefit or betterment of another. Beauty is that which when seen pleases. Goodness is that which when experienced benefits. That which is good makes us better heals us, restores us, improves us, strengthens us, and makes us right, perhaps when we were wrong. God is good. When we live in sync with God, then we too 
reflect this character. Goodness or generosity isn't a front, it isn't a photo op, it isn't about getting noticed, it isn't a marketing strategy, it is an authentic way of being. This goodness, this generosity, this way of living is seen in Jesus. And that's exactly why it is fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is evidence of life. Life as designed by God is designed for good. And it is the Spirit which brings this to fruition. As followers of Christ, then, we have got to remain committed to that which is good. Whether that be in private or in public, in church or at home or in the world. Goodness and generosity should be bared out in our lives. There's an old spiritual, he went about doing good. And it goes like this. He went about doing good, helping wherever he could. Our example is he, and like him we should be, who went about doing good. It was love revealed when the lame he healed, the blinded one made to see. When he raised the dead, the hungering fed, the demon possessed set free. He went about doing good. The fruit of the Spirit then enables, calls, even urges us then to be about doing good. And that is an act of our next fruit, faithfulness. I hope by now you're seeing the trend that these aren't individual qualities, but they're all interconnected. If we are to bear the fruit of the Spirit, we can't bear just one, but we must bear them all in a bundle. Faithfulness is living with integrity and devotion. It is doing what we're supposed to do and doing it with consistency over a lifetime. Faithful people are people who are all in no matter what comes their way, that there's nothing that's going to make them waver from their commitment. That commitment to God and to others. Faithfulness means that when we say someone is faithful, you or I or God doesn't have to worry about what they're going to do because they're the same last week as they are today and the same that they'll be next week. They don't change. They are consistent with their integrity. That's the nature of God. God is faithful. We can count on God no matter what, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing, not anything, is ever going to take that away from us. And that's why faithfulness, then, is the fruit of God in our lives. Another way that you can look at faithfulness is loyalty. Loyalty is fully committed devotion born from a place of love and appreciation. And when it is lived out, it means steadfast commitment. And in the case of faith, it means steadfast commitment to Christ, the gospel, and the church. It means unfaltering devotion to those whom we are called to love and a resolute willingness to do the work that, to which we have been called. Faithfulness is knowing that what you believe, who you love, and what you are dedicated to. Faithfulness means knowing that you know that you know that you know what it is that you believe and what it is that you live for. It is setting your life on a track of living for Christ and not getting off of it. Not getting on the train going the other way or not derailing somewhere along the way, but sticking to the trajectory of following Christ. And that brings us to gentleness. This might be the most important one to think about in an election week. Don't worry, I'm not talking candidates. Just the general idea that there will be a big decision made in the country this week. 
And regardless of how that big decision goes, we've all got to make choices about how we conduct ourselves with each other. And gentleness is a good word for that. Gentleness is handling conflicts and quarrels, rejection and unfairness or harsh words spoken against us as Jesus would. Not with running off at the mouth and grandiose arguments of self-defense. Not with aggressive and mean words, nor even with angry body language. That last sentence is a reminder to me because my face and my body will give me away well before my mouth ever does. I don't even have to open my mouth for people to know when I'm upset. But with gentleness and concern for the other, it reminds us to, dispense, to depend on the Spirit to help us tone that down. Even, no, not even, especially toward those we believe who are offensive to us. Gentleness is remembering that the other person, no matter how irritating, frustrating, fill in your adjective or verb, both, is having acute awareness that they are a person too. That a person is a person with their own feelings, opinions, and perspectives. Gentleness is recognizing the other person may be just as hurt as you are. And we are stuck, absolutely stuck. I'm off script now, so who knows where this will go in this country, in this cycle of division and hatred and I'm right and you're wrong and I'm going to hate you for it. Or at the very least, I'm going to dislike you for it. You disgust me. We're stuck in the cycle where we put each other down and there's not a hope in this world of any kind of future direction if that cycle's not broken. Church, if there's anybody on this planet that ought to be able to break that cycle, it is us. We ought to be the ones who are able to sit down at the table, and I don't care if you've got the most liberal on one side of the table and the most conservative person in the world on the other, we ought to be the people who can sit down at that table and facilitate that discussion without getting ticked off and storming away from the table like petulant children. That is what it means to bear the fruit of the Spirit and to live out gentleness. That's the people that Christ calls us to be. To be the ones who break those kind of cycles. And no, it doesn't mean that we stand by and we take abuse you could respond, even when you're angry with gentleness, you can respond and still be firm and clear, but you can do it without hatred and anger and frustration and name-calling. But in our world, we've forgotten how to do that. When we think of the loudest, most quoted, most read people in the world, is gentleness the first thing that comes to your mind? No, not if we're honest, not even among most quote-unquote Christian leaders, especially right now. We desperately need to bear the fruit of the Spirit among the world in which we live. And in doing so, in many ways, we've got to practice this last one this bow that holds this spiritual fruit basket together, self-control. When I was a teenager and a young adult in my 20s, I, like a lot of young men, had a fascination with cool, fast cars. Had a couple of Mustangs and a Corvette, 
as Ricky Bobby would say, I want to go fast. But what I quickly figured out about going fast was that no matter how much power you had under the hood, if you couldn't get that power to the ground, you didn't go anywhere. You literally would just spin your wheels. Sure, you could do an awesome burnout and waste plenty of money on tires and make awesome smoke clouds, but no speed. If there was no control where the rubber met the road, then that power was not of much use. So it is with our spiritual power. If we do not have the ability to use self-control, then the power of the Spirit in our lives is robbed of its ability. The fruit of the Spirit is greatly hampered if we do not have self-control. Self-control is the quality by which we are able to deny ourselves and allow the Spirit to truly bear fruit in our lives. That doesn't mean that we have to go live in a hole somewhere and never interact with the world. Though admittedly, a lot of these would be easier to put into practice if we didn't have to interact with other humans. But bearing fruit doesn't mean that we get to do that. It also doesn't mean that we have to live by some narrow, restricted, fundamentalist set of rules that says you can do this, but you can't do that. The fruit of the Spirit was never intended to be this restrictive list, but rather to give us the freedom to, to live our life in a way that not only blesses us, but blesses others. It's not a prison, it's freedom. But it means, self-control means that we've got to recognize that which is contradictory to the fruit of the Spirit. And when those things that are contradictory to the fruit of the Spirit tries to take the will of our lives, we pull a carry under wood and we jerk that thing back over and tell Jesus to take the wheel. That's self-control. Knowing what tempts us, what pulls us off track, our own weaknesses, knowing those things that cause our fruit to become rotten, and trusting the Spirit to help us overcome those challenges. When it comes to self-control, Martin Luther, father of the Reformation, Describe self-control this way, and it's a little heady, but it's Martin Luther, so one would expect it to be. But he said, self-control is not seeking one's own good, but that of another. And in this, its whole way of living consists. For in that, it does not seek its own will, but it crucifies the flesh. Because it seeks the good of another, self-control works love. Thus, in each sphere, it does God's will, living justly with neighbor and devoutly toward God. This morning, we will partake in the fruit of the Lord's table, the fruit of the vine and the fruit of the field, in the form of juice and wafer. In so doing, as we partake in communion, we are professing that we are, in fact, in communion with the Spirit of God. That we are a people who enjoy the fruit of salvation and are a people who are committed to bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So then, as we move toward that time, let us set our hearts and minds toward the table and let us do so with the fruit of the Spirit in mind. Please stand for our closing hymn, Be Still My Soul.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you, Lord, for we want to abide in you. For we want to allow the fruit of your spirit to grow in our lives. Lord, as we come to the table this morning, help this be a reminder of what you did, what you gave, how you lived. And Lord, in remembrance of you, may we desire to see those same things bared forth in our life as well. Thank you for loving us, for guiding us, Thank you for our time of worship this morning. Now may you bless our time together in this act of communion. Amen. I invite everyone to take your cup and peel back, pop and remove your wafer. Christ's body in communion we remember that it was broken for us in crucifixion but this morning may we also remember what Christ did with his body as he lived how he loved how he served how he gave of himself everywhere he went as that spiritual goes how in his body he went about doing good. May we remember what Christ did in his body and may we do so likewise with our bodies. Christ's body given for you.
the fruit of the vine, whether wine or juice. We are reminded of Christ's blood. Not only the blood that was shed upon Calvary's hill for us, but the blood that flowed through Christ, giving him life as a man, fully God, fully man. May it be a reminder of us of the very gift of life and that what a gift life is that's given to us to bear fruit. As we partake of this, may we remember Christ's blood shed, but may we also remember the gift of life and the gift that it is to live that life bearing fruit for the one who gave his life for us. Christ's blood given for you. May we pray. Almighty God, how we pray that our lives would show forth the beautiful fruit of the Spirit, which is rooted and grounded in godly love and produced in a life that it walks in spirit and truth. We pray that the life of Christ may guard our spirit and rule our lives and that we may be fully given to your leading and guidance. Teach us to walk in your spirit, to live for you to depend upon your grace and your strength to fulfill the calling that you have given us to live out love as you have loved us. We pray that in your mercy you would develop and keep us and that every opportunity we have to demonstrate your love in action, attitude, mood, and motive will be taken that we will walk in holiness and in humility all the days of our life may we remember the beautiful fruit of your life and may it remind us to bear your fruit in our own Amen <laughs>